I'm Alan Mattiso. I'm the associate director here, and I uh, am pleased to welcome everyone to breakfast at the Baker Institute. Um, uh, the Baker Institute hosts breakfasts um, on occasion because they are uh, really uh, ideal uh, occasions for uh, informal conversation, and that's what we're going to have here today. But it won't be ordinary conversation because we have two distinguished diplomats who have played uh, significant roles in, in, um, in recent history. Um, uh, we're uh, particularly pleased to have at Rice uh, today, uh, the French ambassador to the United States, Gerard Arnault. Um, he's had a 30-year career with the French Foreign Ministry. He has occupied um, uh, important responsibilities for his government. I'll just mention a few of these. The Director General for Political Affairs and Security in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He was the permanent representative of France in the United, in the United Nations. He was the ambassador to Israel, and from 2003 to 2006, Ambassador Arnaud was the French negotiator in the Iranian nuclear uh, issue. He's also, since uh, 2014, uh, been um, the ambassador um, uh, for his government in Washington. He is uh, an expert on um, Middle East and security affairs. Uh, he is not only um, a practitioner of diplomacy, um, he writes about it in prestigious uh, journals, and we are, as I say, very pleased to have him on our, on our panel here. Uh, our other panelist is Ambassador uh, Edward Dirigian. He's the founder. Um, he is the director of the Baker Institute. Uh, everyone, I think, here knows him. He also had a 30-year career. It spanned um, administrations from John F. Kennedy uh, to uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, he rose uh, through the ranks of the Foreign Service to the very pinnacle. He was an ambassador to uh, Israel. He was ambassador to Syria, and he was assistant secretary of state for, uh, for Near East uh, Affairs. He also um, has expertise in the Middle East and security affairs. I might mention that he has French connections. Um, uh, he married a French bride. Um, he always says that was uh, the best decision he ever made. Uh, and in the mid-70s, he spent a year as the American uh, Consul General in Bordeaux, and he is fond of saying uh, that um, while he was there, he almost gave his, his liver for his, his country. <laughs> uh, so um, please welcome our panelists. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Ambassador, we're delighted, as Alan said, to have you here. Uh, you know, we mentioned uh, our service in, in Bordeaux. We were there in 1976 during the bicentennial of the American Revolution, and all of France celebrated that. And it, it was very touching to see the deep ties between our two countries and how they were manifested there. Um, we, we know that uh, there is this uh, L'Hermion, this boat, that, uh, this ship that uh, the Marquis de Lafayette uh, uh, traveled on to come to the United States to help uh, our country in its revolution. And uh, that, uh, that ship is uh, obviously on its way now, and uh, it's another symbol of the uh, relationship. Uh, I was amused when we were in Bordeaux uh, that, uh, you know, the Aquitaine, almost every port town and city claimed that Lafayette left from their place. So I had to make this speech that my wife got very bored with because I had to make it in about 20 places. It was the same speech. And once she told me, if you give that speech one more time, I'm leaving the room. But uh, it was just a pride uh, of the French and with Lafayette and the American Revolution. And so uh, given the historic depth of the US-French relationship, uh, it would be wonderful to have your ideas on what the relationship, how the relationship fares today. No, first, thank you, and uh, I think it's an honor to be here. It's my first visit to Houston. Um, you know, I'm coming back first, uh, coming back to L'Hermione. You know, really, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful endeavor uh, because French and American uh, citizens have decided to rebuild the ship of Lafayette as it was, you know, in 1780. 
and it was a very long endeavor because it's uh, it doesn't it's not that easy you know because they had to rediscover the way the carpenters were working the way they were making ropes and they were making you know really to make a 18th century sailing boat again it took 17 years it it dozens of millions of dollars actually it was very costly so it's a wonderful ship and yet it, and she's sailing right now from uh, from France uh, to the US and she will arrive uh, the 5th of June in Yorktown which is not by chance that we have chosen this place and there will there will be the governor of Virginia there will be a French minister after that it will go to Mount Vernon which would be also symbolic and and quite uh, quite grand and, and beautiful. And the 4th of July, it will be under the Statue of Liberty in New York City. So it's, it's really, it will be uh, really. <laughs> and it's a Franco-American endeavor. You know, really there, the, 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 the chairman of the group is an American, the, uh, you know, Mr. Miles Young. So it's, it's, it's great. The Franco-American relationship, you know, it's really, it's a family relationship. You know, we are the only country of the G7 never to have been at war with the US. But nevertheless, as a, <laughs> I, I really I remind people, you know, from time to time that really we are just celebrating the, 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 the 200th anniversary of the burning of the White House by the British, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really, that's, uh, you know, really, I want to help my British colleague, you know, really, in the bilateral relationship. I don't think the British Consul General. <laughs> really, <it's>, uh, <laughs> uh, actually, we have, uh, uh, we have been very good at having good family squabbles. And you know, the family squabbles they are the best ones and the worst ones. Uh, and I'm not going to come back to what happened 12 years ago uh, on, on Iraq, which was a very good example of, of our squabbles. But when the time comes of the, the real challenges, we have always been together. You know, uh, we'll celebrate in, uh, uh, I think, in, 19, uh, in 2017, the centennial of your uh, uh, involvement in the, of the First World War. Uh, we have celebrated the 70th anniversary of the day last year. It was very moving in Normandy. And we, are, we will be celebrating now the end of the Second World War. And today, in, fortunately, in a, in a less uh, dramatic uh, situation, we are still fighting together. France was the first country immediately to send uh, airplanes to, uh, to Iraq, you know, really, to support the American strikes against ISIL. And right now, and uh, I think it's not well known, but it's, uh, uh, it's real in the Sahel region. You know, in, in, in Africa, we have deployed, uh, the French, we have deployed more than 3,000 soldiers fighting uh, the terrorists. And, and we are helped and supported by the Americans uh, who are providing us with uh, intelligence and, and some uh, tactical airlift. So our, our relationship is extremely strong. Um, as you know, we have been victims of attacks, terrorist attacks in Paris in January, which I don't make a comparison on the scale of victims, but in a sense, it's a bit our 9-11. And uh, so personally, for instance, I went to your joint command of special forces, of the US special forces, to simply ask advice, saying, what did you do since the 9-11? Which decisions do you take? Which mistakes did you commit? So that we are not going to commit the same, mista the same mistakes because we are uh, uh, really facing, in a sense, the same challenge. So when President Obama came to the French embassy to sign the Condolence book after the attacks, um, really he told us, uh, he told me, and he said, basically, it's a global fight, it's a common fight. Uh, so again, we are uh, defending our common values, we are defending our common interests, and we are facing uh, the same threat, uh, which is a way of reminding us that whatever, you know, and it's legitimate that we could have some disagreements, but again, we are, uh, unfortunately, in a sense, uh, we, are, we are together, and that will be a fight for a long-term fight, unfortunately. Thank you. I'd like to draw the conversation toward Europe and France's role in Europe. Uh, there's a growing skepticism that Europe is not a, and the EU is truly not a political and fiscal union, but it's basically a currency union, and that countries like France and Italy and others are in dire need of structural economic reforms. This is a big challenge, and there's a great deal of interest and concern 
uh, certainly in financial circles, on the economic future of Europe because you're such a economic powerhouse in the world. And if Europe doesn't make it, that uh, this will have an adverse impact on the global economy. Your, your thoughts on that? You know, it's, in a sense, it's very difficult for the Americans to understand the French and the French to understand the Americans because we are, in a sense, founded on two opposite views. In this country, this country has been built against the state. It was built against the colonial state, the British state, or it was built, you know, by immigrants who were fleeing states which were either corrupt, authoritarian, or ineffective. And so which explains this very ambiguous relationship that you have versus the state. While in France, actually, France was created by the state. In France, there was a state before a nation. So, you know, when Tocqueville came to the U.S. in the 19th century and he wrote this incredible book, you know, uh, about democracy in, in America, he emphasized this point. You know, really, when the French have a problem, they are rushing to the state. When the Americans have a problem, they consider it's because of the state. So, really, so <laughs> very often, you know, when you look at, and when you look at France, you really, you said, what, what does it mean, you know, really? Uh, but in a sense, it works. You know, we are, the, we are the fifth or the sixth economy in the world. We are quite resilient and we have been devastated by two world wars. We don't have any natural resources and nevertheless, we are there. Fifth or sixth economy, uh, a, a economy in the world. We are, we are also, we are resilient, but it's also the fact is that we have a very good demography. Because the problem of Europe is largely that it's an aging continent. Right now, you have in 2015, 80 million of Germans, 65 million of French. In 2013, 2030, in less 15 years, there will be more French than Germans in Europe. You know, really, and, and that's, a general, that, that's a general trend, but the French are making babies. And I, I'm not going to explain why, but uh, <laughs> uh, really, but they are doing it. It's you know, really, wine. which means also that even in the French are, you know, whining, because we are a nation of whiners. You know, really, you go to France all the time, you know, we are whining about everything. You know, really, from the weather to the Americans, we are always whining, you know, really. <laughs> But the fact is that actually it, it doesn't work that bad. Having said that, of course, uh, the economic crisis is still looming uh, in Europe, all over Europe, and, and there is the, the Euro crisis. I will come to the Euro crisis. Uh, what I, the French government you know, really uh, has decided and really to, to enter into a real reform policy. Uh, you know, it's not that politically easy. You know, really, of course, when, when you, the Wall Street, for the Wall Street Journal, it's very easy. You know, really, simply you cut the benefits to the people. But unfortunately, the French people don't read that much the Wall Street Journal and are not that much satisfied by the idea of seeing their benefits cut. So we are a democracy. Uh, so it's a painful, painful reforms. The French government is committed to do it, but it, it, has, it has also to do it in, it has also to do it in an incremental manner. So the reforms are, are, are made, and, and if you go to, the, uh, to investment firms, you know, really I go, I meet a lot of, of, of managers in, the, in this country, and the ones who have invested in France will tell you that actually the infrastructures are top level. We have the best infrastructures, you know, really, I should say, in the world. Our, our manpower is very well formed, very, you know, really, it's a very good m manpower and actually very loyal also to the corporation. You know, really, a lot of, of uh, French are, are working 20 years in the same corporation. You know, really, they are loyal to the corporation. And, and also, the fact is that, again, people don't know it, but France is, is moving forward, is reforming herself at our own tempo, but we are, we are, we are doing it. Here now we are facing this, this problem that we have created the Eurozone in the beginning of the, the century uh, with the idea that an economic government will come. Because basically what happens between Greece and Germany, between, you know, it's not, you know, the, frankly, the, it's not more than between the poorest state in the US and the richest state in the US. You know, really the difference is not that big. But in this country, you have a federal government, which is organizing transfers 
you know, between uh, the two states through the tax system. You know, really, in a sense, it's organized. It's you don't, you accept it. While in Europe, we have not done it. Uh, uh, so it's, we have this, this strange situation of a currency unit, currency union without a federal, uh, a federal government. So uh, the, the consequence is now that for the poorest country in the union, uh, really the situation is very dire. It's very dire because it can't devalue, because it has the euro, you know, so it is doomed to what we call an internal devaluation, which means, you know, really decreasing the wages, decreasing the expenditures, and it's extremely painful. Uh, Greece has lost 25% of uh, uh, its GDP in three years. It's more or less uh, what you really the US went through during the 1929 crisis. So it, uh, Greece is a democracy, so as you can guess, it has led the electors, you know, the main industry, you know, uh, really to vote, to vote for a protest party. And now we have this crisis, people in Greece saying is enough is enough. And, and of course, the German taxpayer who is subsidizing Greece, and like all the European uh, taxpayers, they say also enough is enough. So we have this very difficult negotiation right now. It's a negotiation. So negotiation, there is a lot of melodrama. It's a bit of poker game. Um, really, basically, the, the, the Germans and the other countries say we don't want to pay more for Greece. The Greeks say we don't want to suffer more. So the question, really, there is a way, there is a way out. If you give this crisis to a, a good diplomat like Ambassador Jerejan, you will find a way out. Unfortunately, you know, really, that's democracies. So there is a political crisis, and I still right now don't know what will come out of it. It would be a disaster, political and moral disaster, if Greece would leave the Eurozone. But the Eurozone now has, has the, the instruments to avoid the contagion to the, to the, to the, other, to the other countries. Mr. Ambassador, France is going to be hosting, I believe, a very important and major conference on climate and climate change, I believe, at the end of the year, toward the end of the year. What, what are your expectations for that? Is anything actually going to be done? Well, actually, when, when the French president decided to host the, uh, what we call the COP21, which is the UN conference on climate change, I think the, all the, the bureaucrats, uh, we were devastated, you know, really, basically, because we considered that the chance of success were quite limited. And uh, so now, unfortunately, we are a democracy. Unfortunately, the president takes this decision, you know, really, and the French bureaucrats regret it. Uh, but so we have to make, a, to make it a success. So, so what, what is the goal of, of this conference uh, at the end of 2015? Basically, um, we don't, you know, we have taken, uh, we have drawn the lessons of the previous failures, especially in Copenhagen in tw 2009. We are also drawing the lessons uh, of uh, the reactions of the public opinion, the, the, the different, there, is, there are a lot of different interests uh, which are at stake, uh, but we, we feel also that the civil society in, in a lot of countries, for a lot of different reasons, the civil society is much more active, much more proactive and vocal about climate uh, change uh, than it was in 2009. So we are not going to have a sort of uh, top-down approach of a Kyoto 2 uh, agreement. There won't be any, you know, really uh, uh, regulatory constraints. What we want to have is a sort of common message coming out of um, Paris, which is, okay, we, the, 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 the world, and I'm going to, to go to the definition of the world, we, the world, we are serious about going to low carbon economy. Every country, every, uh, and I will come to it also, every uh, economic sector has to do it on its own terms, on its own tempo, but the idea, the general idea is low carbon economy is the future of our economies, on, of our societies. Which, what, what does it mean? First, it means on the, the state side, there will be a state negotiation uh, with commitments uh, taken uh, for, the, for the future. Uh, 
again, I think a good example has been given by the negotiation conducted by President Obama with China. Uh, when you look at the result, you could be very cynical, saying, well, the Chinese have not really made any commitment. The, the, what is very important, it was the first time that the Chinese takes a, take a commitment on climate change. It's the first time that they, they say, really, actually, we are going to do something, you know, really. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a clear signal, uh, which is sent to all states, that actually something is happening, uh, that there is a climate disruption, and that we have to, to act together. So there, the states are going to take, uh, to take commitments. Uh, of course, the result won't be uh, the result that we are hoping for. Uh, you know, people, I'm sure that a lot of experts will, uh, will complain, will say, you know, we are not going to be under the two degrees limit. Uh, these, these commitments are not enough. Uh, but again, one size doesn't fit all. Uh, we have to be realistic, so we have to take commitments on the basis of, of our the economies, uh, of what our economies permit. But we have also to work uh, with everybody beyond the states. So it means the local authorities. As you know, uh, in this country, for instance, the local authorities, the states or the cities are doing a lot of job, a, a lot of things. You know, really, even cities where you don't use the word climate change, actually what is done by the, by the, the municipalities on the, because of the energy uh, efficiency, for instance. You know, really a lot of cities are doing great things, or the water management, the public transportation systems, uh, so there are, there are mobilization of local authorities. So they will have, you know, they will be invited also to Paris. And you have, of course, which is very important, the private sector. You know, a few days ago, I organized, I organized a dinner in the, at the French residence um, in, in, New, in Washington around the, the French negotiator uh, for climate change and also around the CEO of GDF Suez, you know, the, the big energy company in, in France. Uh, who, who has taken a sort of responsibility to mobilize the, the, the private sector. And there was representatives of a lot, a lot of Amer very important U.S. corporations and also of NGOs working with the business community. And, you know, really, you, you hear it. You know, will this, this U.S. corporation say, yes, we want to work on renewable energy. Yes, we want to, to you know, to move forward. So there will be also in Paris, you know, really, we are going, we, Paris will be a business friendly uh, 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 meeting. So there will be also meeting with the private sector. The private sector will be called to, you know, to show also the technological solutions. You know, there will be a hall, a big hall where, you know, technological uh, in inventions uh, uh, will be shown. Because a lot of people, and you know it, a lot of people don't, really don't realize how much the technology has, has moved forward, has progressed, how much we are close to have a lot of technological solutions for, for, for fighting uh, climate, climate change. So it's really, we need a, a, a message. Uh, more than figures, more than, than commitments, really no straight jacket, uh, no, uh, of course, no moralization. You know, really simply saying, let's, it's our common interest to go to a low carbon economy. And for the private sector to say, there, there is money to make. There are jobs to create there. So go for it, go for it, we are serious. So I know, I know that in this country, and maybe especially in this city, that's, that's a bit uh, a, a, a message which is maybe difficult to, to, to convey. Uh, but I'm quite excited because everywhere I go and meeting again, meeting the corpor you know, corporate leaders, meeting um, mayors, and uh, I, I really, I feel that really also uh, a lot of initiatives are there that something is simmering, you know, really, and uh, that the, the U.S., like the other countries, but for different reasons, are also really joining, uh, uh, joining our, our common fight. Thank you. Given your extensive uh, experience in the practice of diplomacy, uh, I'd like to uh, raise this uh, subject. There's a very flattering description uh, of you from Samantha Power, our ambassador to the U.N., uh, that goes, quote, don't let his epic charm fool you. Gérard is a master strategist, a diplomatic and bureaucratic samurai, and one of the most authentic and authentically decent people ever to practice diplomacy, unquote. Now, I've never gotten 
press like that. <laughs> May, and I'm, I'm a bit jealous. I may, mean, I, <laughs> may I tell you how I got it? You know, yes, really. Yes. Uh, Th that would be very good. To know really, <laughs> and uh, in very Gallic way, as you say, very French way. Actually, one day, you know, um, Samantha Power is your, your representative to the UN Security Council. I was there, and one day, in a very French way, I send her an SMS saying, "You know, Samantha, on behalf of the French mission, I can tell you, you are extremely beautiful this morning." <laughs> And she sent me back, she sent me back saying it's the best SMS I've ever received. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, I was interviewed before because the New Yorker was writing, uh, you know, a profile of Samantha Power. So in a very French way, I, I told this anecdote. My God, I was immediately attacked everywhere as a sort of macho, you know, really. I was criticized, and she was criticized for, you know, lying low in front of French machism. It was <laughs> terrible, you know, really. So she called me saying, oh, Gérard, you know, really, we were laughing. And her, her husband took the, the phone and said, Gérard, I, I should say, you are right. She's beautiful. So I told him, I said, please, Cass, you, you sound like a French libertine, you know, condoning a free song. Please stop it. <laughs> so maybe that's the reason of the... <laughs> okay. I'd like to uh, share with you one of my experiences and to get your reaction and the practice of diplomacy. As a young diplomat, I, I had a mentor who told me, he said, effective practice of diplomacy depends on first your ability to listen to your interlocutor to understand his or her position even better than they perhaps can enunciate it. And then only after you've gone through that to start engaging them in a discussion or a negotiation. And in that way, you sort of captivate them because you show that you understand where they're coming from. And you just don't go into a negotiation with your views and putting your positions on the table and expecting it to be uh, achieved. Uh, that affected me a great deal in my uh, young years in the terms of the practice of diplomacy. But uh, your, your, your impressions of... And Actually, it, it goes beyond the diplomacy. I think in your life, in your private life, you know, really, you, you need to negotiate or simply you need to negotiate uh, the life of a couple, which is also a negotiation in a sense. I think the, the what very, very often I, I, I tell my, my young diplomats is by using a French expression, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the other side. You have to see the, the conflict or you have to see uh, the dispute or the problem from the other side. And, and if you do it, you know, including in the, in the a couple squabble, it, it's really suddenly you may realize that seen from the other side, the same problem could look in a very different way. So the, the first thing I, I always try to do is to try to understand from the other side <coughs> how they see the, the conflict. And, and they, do, they do it on the basis of history. They do it also on the basis of their own interest. You know, really, look at the Ukraine crisis. You know, really, I think it could be totally counterproductive to say simply the Russians are wrong. Okay, the Russians are wrong, but really, what is next? <laughs> so uh, it's much more exciting, in a sense, and productive to try to see the conflict of Ukraine from a Russian point of view, which is not to say they are right or wrong, but again, uh, uh, the Russia is not the empire of evil. The Russia is a country with normal people, so why should they have this policy towards Ukraine? And for instance, you realize that uh, I think whoever, whomever you meet in Russia, liberal or not liberal, they don't consider Ukraine as a foreign country. Really, that's something they really they can't. You know, and again, uh, it doesn't mean that we have to accept it, but we have to take into account. You know, really, it's important to take it into account. You know, my colleague, the, the Russian ambassador to Washington D.C., who is quite bright. And, you know, really, basically, he has an Ukrainian name, he's, he has a house in Kiev, his family is Ukrainian, his father, you know, was fighting in the Ukrainian forest against the Germans, and so on, and so on. So there is this sort of centuries of history, and so we have, that's an example, you know, and, uh, and after that, you have also to, to say, to think that if we want to reach an agreement with Russia, you suddenly realize what are their red lines. And that's very important in any negotiation. 
the first thing is to realize what are the red lines. Because, of course, you, you shouldn't uh, really, you shouldn't analyze their interests from your point of view. Your, their interest is them who decide what are their interests, even if they are, if they are wrong <laughs> from your point of view. But you know, really, they are really they decide, and you have to to to, to work on this. Uh, you have to work on this basis. A second element also is you have to think of what do they think of yourself. And because basically, it's a very strange way. Of course, you have you have a lot of prejudice about what they what they are and what they think and what they do. But they have also prejudice about you, and in a very from time to time, strange prejudice. Uh, so you have to, to know, to know that, and to, you have also to, so you have to go through this, this curtain or through this obstacle of prejudice. It means that you have maybe to repeat 20 times your position before it's really, it's dripping, uh, uh, you know, through all this wall of prejudice. So again, it's, it's really, it's a real, it's a real job. It's really trying to, to understand, to understand the other side. And, and, and that's uh, one of the limitations of the French diplomacy, because the French are Cartesian, you know, really we are. And so we arrive and we consider that the solution that we, are, we have is the best solution, because it's a solution based on reason. And, really, and for us, when the other side doesn't accept our solution, which is based on reason, but which by coincidence, actually, it's also fitting the French interest, but that we forget it, <laughs> we don't understand why the other side doesn't accept the, the, the reasonable solution that we are, that we are putting on the table, so we consider they are, they are idiots, usually. <laughs> <laughs> you and I have uh, served as our ambassadors to the State of Israel. Uh, which, as you know, is a very challenging uh, job for any diplomat, but a very intriguing one. Uh, the Middle East, of course, is in great turmoil. Uh, you have great expertise in, in, in the region. Uh, we here at the Baker Institute have just recently produced a report called the, uh, the Middle East Cauldron and U.S. Middle East Policy. And the basic theme of that is that with all these non-state actors that have risen, uh, the Al-Qaeda, ISIS, all these other uh, uh, extremist uh, uh, groups, uh, the failing state systems in the Middle East that have not provided the necessary prosperity, personal security, jobs for their people. There are many causes for the turmoil that we've seen, the Arab Spring after the Arab Spring, and the uh, very uh, uh, incredibly complex situation we're facing today uh, throughout the whole uh, region. And uh, we proposed in this report basically that the U.S. administration should follow a two-track policy. One, counterterrorism, a very robust counterterrorism policy against the bad guys, be it ISIS, be it Al-Qaeda, whoever the terrorists are. Because in any country, your president, our president, uh, their first priority is to uh, secure the homeland and the safety of our citizens. So counterterrorism is obviously one, but it's obviously an insufficient policy to deal with alone, to deal with the complexity of what's happening in the region, given all these structural problems. And so the question arises is, what can the outside world do to basically try to alleviate the circumstances in which extremism is, is being fostered in the, in, in, in the Middle East? And one of our prejudices in our report is that the struggle in the Muslim world today is their struggle. It's a struggle between the forces of moderation and extremism. And uh, it's their struggle to win or lose. But then how can we on the outside affect the forces and encourage the forces of moderation in the region? Your thoughts. <laughs> I have three it's hours. a simple question. I have three hours, you know, really. <laughs> so now, you know, really, maybe you can take some coffee. And you won't leave the room before, before noon. Um, of course, I don't have the answer. But um, no, first for us, uh, for us, the, as you know, we had these terrorist attacks in Paris. And um, it's, it was not a surprise. We knew that sooner or later uh, something will happen. Because, you know, um, we have uh, in France, and in Europe, we have thousands. In France, it's around, I think, 3,000 of, of youth who are radicalized. 
uh, radicalized around a, a really a brand of radical Islam, uh, which is also rapidly anti-Semitic. So we, we have, you know, for now for the last 10 years, we have been protected synagogues and, and Jewish schools. Uh, but we knew that these few thousands of youth that we can't arrest because of their opinion. You know, really, we are a democracy. So the question mark uh, is whether they are going to cross the line or they are not going to cross the line. And three, four thousands of youth, you know, we can't monitor, we can't monitor them 24-7. Well, if to monitor one of them, you, you need between 10 and 12 agents, you know, really 24-7. So we had this, this, really, in a sense, this potential threat. And on top of that, and going to the Middle East also, we have uh, four, six or seven thousands of young Europeans are, went are, or, 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 or we want to go to Syria, to the battlefield. For France only, it's, it's 1,400, 1,400 French. We consider that more than 80 French died in Syria. Of course, they are coming back and they're coming back military trained and they're coming back radicalized. So that's really a major threat to our internal security. And, it, it, and, and again, sooner or later, something was, was to happen and it, it, it did, and, and, unfortunately. So for us, what is happening in the Middle East is a, a, a real, real uh, direct threat to our national security. I said 1400. For you, it's more or less, for the Americans, it's between 150 and 200 only, you know, really considering. But nevertheless, you'll have also to, to face this, 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 this problem. So it's, it's a threat. The second one, of course, uh, I think you, you read in the newspapers, is that uh, the collapse of um, any authority in Libya is driving thousands, dozens of thousands of migrants to try to cross the Mediterranean Sea. So which leads, of course, to incredible tragedies, you know, ships, you know, droning. Hundreds, thousands of migrants have died last year trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea. But as you, you can guess, the pred our predicament, because you have it in a sense, be because of your bo southern border, we we'll try to imagine these people arriving in Europe and, and the reaction of the population. You know, really, and uh, so it's for us, it's a humanitarian, economic and political major problem and the security on the top of that. And among these migrants, there could be terrorists coming also. So it's really, it's for, for us, for the French, for, uh, for Spain, Italy, and uh, at least the half, the southern part of Europe, it's the major, the major threat. You know, if you ask the French, the, what is your, the threat, they won't answer Russia. You know, really, it's here for us. It's, it's really direct threat. So of course, we are, uh, we are concerned by what is happening in the, in the, in the Middle East. We, 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 we really, since the beginning of the Syrian crisis in 2011, <clears throat> we would have wanted, you know, really the international community to intervene more directly. Because in the beginning, what was happening in Syria was obviously uh, people in the streets, we were, f were fed up with this uh, the dictatorship and really wanted simply uh, a, a better life. Uh, we didn't, uh, the West didn't intervene, and the civil war has become what is always a civil war, which means that the, 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 the moderates are not good fighters, the moderates are superseded by the extremists. So now we are in a sort of uh, a no-solution game. On one side, you have Bashar al-Assad, who is really, we, who has been incredibly violent and, uh, and he is still incredibly violent, you know, really, he, he has killed hundreds of thousands of his citizens, uh, uh, is really supported by Iran and Russia, and apparently, for the moment at least, he can't be defeated, but at the same time, he, he can't win, which means that he can't retake the control of the country. So it's uh, an ongoing crisis. Every year, 500 young French are going to, uh, to Syria, 500 every year, you know, at the, the tempo that we have. So, so again, I, I, it's, it's, it's really a, 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 an impossible situation. And now we have really uh, uh, Iraq. For us, the Iraqi crisis, it's the Syrian crisis which has spread. Mm. Really, the, 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 for us, the, the core of the crisis is, is, in, is, in, is in Syria. If you want to, if, uh, you know, 
I'm French, so I'm obliged at some moment to be a bit intellectual and dogmatic. So really, so let's, let's go uh, 30,000 feet, you know, really high. You're not obliged to follow me, you know, really. And um, at the same time, you know, so you have this, when you look at the Middle East, you know, our president, General de Gaulle, you know, really in, in the 20s was appointed as a, he was an officer and he was sent to the French mandate of Lebanon and Syria. And he, re he wrote, you know, I went to the complicated East with very simple ideas. So I think you have also at some moment, you know, if you don't want to drone in the Middle East, to take simple ideas. And simple ideas are the, the basic geopolitical reality. So what do you have now in the Middle East? You have, you know, on one side you have Iran. And, and frankly, I will be a bit provocative, but I'm not sure that the Iran of the Islamic Republic is conducting a policy which is different from the Iran of the Shah or the Iran of a republic. Basically, when you look at the geopolitics, there is one power in this part of the world, which is Iran. And when you have a power, you want to use it. And especially if your neighbors are very weak. And, and it's the case. The Sunni world, you know, which means the Gulf monarchies and, you know, now has been weakened by the domestic crisis. And Iran is trying to take advantage of it. You know, really, and that's, I guess, the normal geopolitical life. Uh, of the world. <coughs> Even under the Shah, actually, uh, Iran had uh, occupied uh, small islands in the Gulf at the expense of Abu Dhabi. You know, really, and even at the time of the Shah, the monarchies were worried, the Gulf monarchies, about the Iranian ambitions. So you have a country which is really a great country with a long history, with a real strong national identity of 70, more than 70 million of inhabitants. And, and this country is simply moving forward because nobody is stopping it, you know, really. And it will move forward as long as we don't stop it or somebody is not stopping it. So that's really the reality, the, the crisis of the, of the Sunni world. Uh, because before, uh, which countries were, in a sense, stopping the Iran? Of course, there was the US, which was protecting the Gulf monarchies, but you had, you had also Iraq. Iraq had been for centuries, <laughs> you know, really the dam against uh, the Iranian ambitions. I'm not going to emphasize that the dam has been destroyed. And I'm not going to emphasize by whom. Uh, but nevertheless, Iraq is not anymore what it was supposed to do. I Iraq has been given to the Shiites, you know, given to the Shiites, which means given to the allies of Iran, you know, really. It's a geopolitical disaster. I stop here. Um, the second <laughs> point is, the second point is, of course, is the, uh, the Egypt. Egypt was also a strong country for on the Sunni world, and really with a strong army and a strong policy. Policy and, and Egypt has been weakened, you know, because of the, the economic difficulties in the for 15 years, and also the political the political crisis. So as we as you know, you know, nature is the, hates the vacuum. So in a sense, Iran is taking advantage of, of the, the, the vacuum. So are we supposed to fill the vacuum? And here I'm a bit at a loss because I have the impression, but that's very personal, that every time that we, the West has militarily intervened, actually it has, in a sense, complicated this, the, the problem, you know, really. You know, ISIS, it's very striking that, you know, when ISIS has, has launched in its offensive, the reaction of the U.S. administration was very restrained. You know, really, first there were strikes to prevent the fall of Baghdad because there was this. And after that, the U.S. administration wanted to have a, a restrained uh, intervention. Actually, it was not what ISIL was looking for. ISIL wanted the U.S. to be there. So, you know, there was this beheading of two uh, U.S. journalists on primetime TV which was, I guess, and a lot of experts show, uh, share this analysis, was to drag you into the conflict. They wanted to, to appear as fighting, you know, really uh, the great Satan, you know, really. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so it means that we are, of course, we have the military power, and unfortunately uh, our allies uh, don't have, but at the same time, using our military power has also negative effects. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I really, I, I really don't know what what could be uh, what could be the answer. 
I think you, in a sense, you have described what could be our long-term policy, uh, which means we shouldn't be on the front line. It shouldn't be the fight again between Islam and the West. Uh, you know, really, uh, in a sense, uh, the problem, it's a problem, as you said, of the Muslim country. You know, really, uh, so we should support our allies, uh, but we shouldn't do the job for them. Mm -hmm. Really, and uh, so Turkey, Saudi Arabia, you know, they have powerful armies, they have means, uh, so we should help them. Uh, but again, I think it would be a mistake uh, to send our forces, to send boots on the ground and to be, to be back, because it's precisely what the ISIL, I guess, is looking for. Good. Uh, last uh, topic I'd like to raise with you before we go for questions from the audience. Uh, Iran, you've been very heavily involved uh, in the Iranian negotiations, and we have the framework agreement. We know that there is still a great deal of work that has to be done. And we also have noticed that uh, France has taken a rather hawkish position during these negotiations. So your, your assessment on what the prospects are for a final agreement to be reached? No, I first, you know, I, I've tried to negotiate with Iranians uh, for three years, and uh, the Iranians didn't engage into the negotiation. Uh, every time we met them, and we met them dozens of times, the first hours was about Cyrus the Great, and uh, the second hour was about the CIA uh, toppling down uh, Mossadegh in 1953, and the first the hour uh, was about the, the rights of the Iranian people. The fourth hour I didn't know because I, I, I was dozing, or I really, or, or I, I, I left to, for, to go and cry in the restrooms. Uh, but um, so in 2012, uh, more seriously, in 2012, the Iranians engaged into the negotiation. They took the strategic decision to negotiate. So far, they didn't really. We were make, putting uh, proposals on the table. They didn't answer. Uh, there in 2012, it means they have taken the decision that they want an agreement. After that. Uh, it's a negotiation, you know, really, and it's not, I'm not going to, it's not by reference to the, to the Iranians, uh, uh, a negotiation uh, with, every, uh, with anybody, it's, it's a, a rug bargaining. Basically, you know, they want to sell you the rug and you want not to pay too much the rug, you know, really. So that's the same thing on the agreement. And, and we are into this game. And they are very good negotiators. We were, in a sense, a bit trapped by this idea of an interim agreement because it's very technical, and as any negotiator knows, until everything is agreed, nothing is agreed, which means that everything is linked to everything, so it's very difficult to have a partial agreement. So eventually, we had this understanding, which is not an agreement, it's an understanding, and there are a lot, a lot of holes to fill. So for the moment, you really, it's very difficult to consider it's bad or good. Uh, you can raise a lot of questions uh, on this understanding, and you don't have the answer. And uh, so we are going to enter the final stage of the negotiation. Again, as, as, as an old negotiator, I will caution, you know, really, for instance, you know, um, Khamenei, the Supreme Guide, is saying, I demand uh, that the sanctions should be lifted the first day. And everybody immediately says, oh, you see, we, don't, we won't have an agreement. But frankly, before any negotiation, there is chess banging. Before any negotiation, you know, each side says, I will never accept, you know, really, what they will accept at the end of the negotiation, you know, really. So basically, that's the melodrama, the usual melodrama, and, uh, and the work of the diplomats after that is to try to, to sugarcoat the surrendering of the other side so that he can argue that actually he got what he wanted in front of his public opinion. So, so it's not very important what, what they can say, you know, really. It's important for you as a negotiator, you know, really to know what will be the tough points on, on the negotiation. For, for us, the, the, the tough points for the negotiation will be the lifting of the sanctions. We are totally against the idea of lifting the sanctions immediately the first day. The lifting of sanctions had to be incremental, conditional, and reversible. 
incremental, you know, really uh, on the, w each time that the Iranians are fulfilling their their commitments, you know, really conditional on on the, the on the condition of the fulfillment and reversible that we could snap back the sanctions if they don't behave. So that's what I guess one the, of of really our first uh, our first demand. Uh, the second one, of course will be on the, the, the extent of the, the research and development that they, they will be allowed to do. The problem that we have at the end of uh, June, first, I guess, are we going to have an agreement at the end of June, because the, it's the, the, the dateline? I guess it will be maybe not the end of June. If we have an agreement, there will be a lot of melodrama, because each side needs melodrama to show to his, uh, uh, to the, to its inner front that he, he really, you are covered of blood, I, get, I got this agreement, you know, really, I couldn't get more. So that's part also of the melodrama of any good negotiation. So maybe it will be, it will be after two or three nights of negotiation, after the 30th of June, and uh, the ministers will spend uh, three or four days or three or four nights in, in a beautiful hotel in Switzerland and so on. You know, really, that will be the, the maybe the game. And uh, the result will be extremely technical. And that will be also the problem, which means that anybody will be able to see in this agreement what he wants to see, if it's good or, or if, it's, if it's not good. We have always, you have always to think in terms of the alternative. So, you know, if you don't have an agreement, what do you have? And um, what you have is, of course, you can sanction I Iran more, it's possible. But so far, the Iranians have really moved forward in a very deliber deliberate way uh, towards the bomb. Uh, so if we don't have an agreement, there are two options. One is strong sanctions, and the Iranians cave in, which, which is possible, you know, really. But uh, the, other, the other one is they don't cave in, and you, you are heading to the military option. You know, really, it's uh, it's very, very it's very simple, and the military option, which which will be complicated, feasible, I guess, but uh, quite complicated, and with a lot of uh, in a region which is already uh, in a turmoil, which have a lot of consequences on 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 the region. So let's have a good agreement, uh, a strong agreement, and and the French side has been really, as you said, I'm not saying oakish, but has been. Uh, demanding uh, on the, on the, on the on the quality uh, or really on the on the quality of of the agreement. Last point: I don't have, we don't have the slightest doubt about the fact that the Iranian program is a military program. We don't have the slightest uh, doubt because why to enrich uranium? You know, really, uh, it's a very simple question. You know, really, what are you going to do if you your enrich uranium? They said, really, to fuel uh, uh, power plants. The problem is that the power plants are not built. So it, and it takes between 10 and 12 years to build a nuclear power plant. So enriching uranium is like if you buy a gas before having the car. You know, it doesn't make any sense. Any military program has started this way, including ours, of course. So thank you. So open to questions. If you uh, stand up and please speak loudly and ask a question. that they would accept nothing short, nothing short, uh, that the Iranians would accept nothing short of, of um, um, you know, immediate cessation of the sanctions? No, I, you know, first, uh, it's a very sensitive uh, topic because, you know, I have lived in Israel. Actually, I've been posted twice in Israel, and uh, I've lost my Hebrew, but I, I know very well the country. and. Uh, what the Iranians said, they didn't say they want to destroy Israel. They say exactly that sooner or later Israel will be uh, uh, will be will disappear. And uh, and of course, if they had said that of Egypt or if they had said that of France, people would simply say it doesn't really well. It's crazy. But with Israel, with the history of the Jewish people, immediately, of course, it's really, uh, there is, in a sense, the guts of the country, there is this sort of really strong and understandable reaction. 
my geopolitical analysis and our geopolitical analysis, in a sense, if you know Iran, if you went to Iran, in a sense, the Iranians are the most pro-American people, the public opinion of, the, of this part of the world, and basically, but maybe the regime, uh, uh, they are, it's not an anti-Semitic people. Their, their contempt is focused on the Arabs. You know, the Iranians are really, they really, they have a sense of their uh, superiority, uh, civilization superiority at the expense, the expense of, their, of their neighbors. In a sense, I think that if they get the bomb, uh, or if they really are close to the nuclear threshold, uh, it will be a threat for the Arab countries, not for Israel, you know, really, because in a sense, the Iranians know what is nuclear deterrence, and the, and the, the Israelis have the way, have really, uh, are really able uh, to annihilate uh, Iran, you know, before even the bomb has left the Iranian, uh, the Iranian soil. You know, in nuclear terms, why Iran really wants the bomb? Frankly, from an Iranian point of view, it makes sense. You know, really, all their, their borders are destabilized. Uh, you have in the neighborhood three undeclared uh, nuclear po powers, uh, declared but not members of the NPT, India, Pakistan, Israel, and they have been victim of weapons of mass destruction. You know, the Iraqis have used chemical weapons against Iran, and we didn't react. There was, everybody was looking the other way while Iraq was violating its commitments, you know, it, because Iraq had signed uh, uh, the Convention of 1925 banishing the use of chemical weapons. And we, the West, actually, we were providing weapons to Iraq, which, which was using chemical weapons, uh, you know. So from an Iranian point of view, you know, you can say, you know, really, why not to have the bomb? You know, really, so... What is the consequence of having the bomb in the geopolitical terms? You know, look at Pakistan. Pakistan was really, very, really very cautious with India because they knew that if there was a war, the, the, the conventional forces of India would overwhelm Pakistan. Once they had the bomb, officially they had the bomb in 1998, the year afterwards, basically, there was the very serious attack in Kashgar, in, in Kashmir. Because basically, having the bomb, the Pakistani knew that the Indian, the Indian army couldn't invade them anymore. So the, having the bomb is giving you an umbrella under which you can conduct conventional, conventional endeavors. So that's what is extremely worrying for the Gulf states, because the Gulf states are protected by the Americans. But if there is no, you know, the Americans are restrained by the nuclear uh, power of Iran, it gives to the, to the Iranians, you know, really an, an incredible influence on, on the region. So again, I, I don't dismiss, I don't dismiss, I'm, I'm convinced that the worries expressed by Prime Minister Netanyahu are totally uh, genuine, really totally, uh, totally genuine, that it's really a strong feeling, a strong conviction that he, that he has. I'm aware also that for an Israeli prime minister, it's, it's very difficult to follow my rezoning, you know, because in a sense, I am really uh, far from the, from, from, from the region. But my conviction is that the, the, the focus, the, 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 the focus of the Iranian ambitions is certainly not, certainly not Israel, you know, really, in a, you know, really, that it's more an ideological uh, flag that they are waving because they feel you know, it has echo, an echo in the, 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 the people of this region. Okay, let me see how we can take this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No, I think, as, you, as I said, uh, um, 
we have a very well, uh, a very good uh, manpower. We have excellent engineers. Um, you know, a lot of them are coming to the U.S. and uh, very often I, I meet them. We consider that actually it's not a negative uh, phenomenon, you know. And we ask them, why are you coming to the U.S.? And th the answer is, first, it's not because of the taxes. Um, because in a sense, they say um, to hire an, an, an engineer, in a sense, it's, it's, it's actually it's very expensive in this country. Uh, because, you know, there is a shortage of engineers or in, the, in, in the U.S. And they are not very loyal to the corporation, you know, really. So they are living very, very easily, and which is not the case in France. Uh, it's not because the taxes, you know, the income tax in New York, in the city, is much higher than, than in France. I'm not talking of Texas. Um, the second point is, they say, it's two, there are two main reasons. The first one is the size of the market, and that's we can't compete. And the second one is the financing. Um, one, uh, you know, the, the, one of the, the problems that we are facing in Europe is the, the shortage of uh, venture capital, you know, really, and the risk. The, 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 in a sense, all the, the way you are facing the risk. In Europe, basically, 70% of the economy is financed by the bank, while in this country, it's between 30 and 40%. And it makes a lot of difference, because when you go to a bank, you know, really, when you are a young entrepreneur, which is a French word, uh, the young entrepreneur, uh, actually, <laughs> of course, the bank is not going to give you really very easily money while, you know, venture capital, uh, it, it's quite different. That's the first. And the second one is, as you know, in the US compared to Europe, and here I'm talking of all of Europe, taking risk is part of your culture. And, and in a sense, failing, it's not the end of your life. While in Europe, uh, it's quite different. You know, if son, a young entrepreneur has failed, after that, it's quite nearly impossible for him, you know, to give, to, to get some new, Financing. So we, we are facing this 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 problem. We have our we we have uh, uh, in a sense we have strengths and, and weaknesses. The strengths in a sense are also linked to the um, the way we are uh, considering uh, uh, our societies, which means that we are good in terms of infrastructures. You are referring to the high speed train. You know, really, and I, I really, I opened the commercials. You would need an high speed train between San Antonio, Austin, Texas, Austin, and uh, really, that would be a great idea. And uh, and uh, and Houston, you know, really, end of the commercials. Um, <laughs> the, so the high speed, you know, high speed train. You know, really, you have. A, uh, I've been told that you have an high speed train called the Acela between Washington and New York. And for an European, you know. It's 220 miles. So an European will not fly for 220 miles. So in a sense, in a very naive way, I took your ISP train. You know, it's really two, 220 miles. It's two hours, 40, 50 minutes. Two hours, 50 minutes, two, 220 miles. My mother was living in Avignon, which was Avignon is 460 miles. And we, I was doing it in two hours, 40 minutes. <laughs> you know, really, so it's, uh, and usually the two hours, 50 minutes of the Acela is totally notional. Totally notional. <laughs> you know, really, it's, uh, so, you, you know, but again, you know, that's part of the culture. You know, we really, we, and also of the, the, the size of the country, we, you know, we have good infrastructures, so we are good at, you know, uh, in Miami, for instance, you know, really they had to, they had to, to dig a tunnel. And, and it's very difficult in Miami because of the, the, the nature of the soil. And eventually, it was only a French corporation who was really, which was able, uh, able to do it. So we, we are also good for waste management, water m management, you know, really, and uh, public transportation, you know, really. I discovered that in, in Boston, for instance, you know, really the manager of the public transportation is our national railway company, really. And, uh, who, who actually they told me, talking of Boston and France, never criticize again the French trade unions, you know, really. Compared to Boston, you know, really, that's... Uh, <laughs> 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 so we, we are managing, and you know, in a lot of you uh, American cities, you look at the bus and you see that it's managed by Veolia, you know, really by French corporations. So we are, uh, actually, we are quite, uh, quite active. So we have uh, uh, our, uh, our, again, we have our strengths, 
and, uh, and the French government is trying to, uh, to liberate the forces of, 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 our, of our economy. Mr. Ambassador, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I know there are many more questions here, but I have to end the oh. conversation now, and we want to thank you very much for an excellent presentation here. Thank you very much. Thank you.